Well, up first on the agenda, I want to welcome Kathy Anderson, and that's kind of funny. It says new consultant, and, and yes, she is new in that position for the moment, but she's certainly not new to that position, and I am delighted that you're back, Kathy. Welcome back to a place that you've been and that we're happy that you're there again. So I'll turn this over to you, Kathy. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts. I hope everybody can hear me. I am so excited to be back in this role. And um, as Dr. Roberts has said, I've been at the department now for eight years. And about seven of those years have been spent, uh, spent in gifted education as the gifted consultant for our state. And uh, I spent away uh, last year with preschool and learned a lot about preschool last year. And it's surprising how many similarities there are to our program. Uh, but I am glad to be back and want to share some information with you today. And so thank you again for inviting me uh, to this opportunity. So let me see if I can share my screen and we'll get started here. All right. Give me just a second to move everything around where I can see my presentation and talk to you at the same time. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that have been going on at KDE during this past summer. And we have a new commissioner who'll be coming on board. His name is Dr. Jason Glass. And Dr. Glass is originally from Brandenburg, Kentucky. He studied at the University of Kentucky. He taught high school social studies for Hazard Independent Schools. He received his doctorate in education from Seton Hall University and a certification in advanced education leadership from Harvard. He has many experiences. He's had several positions with different state uh, departments of education across our country. He was the, also the vice president of quality ratings for the Quality Star Learning. He was senior, direct, uh, senior director of human capital strategy for Battelle for kids. Uh, for kids. He was the chief state school officer. Uh, he was also a superintendent of Eagle County Public Schools and Jefferson County Public Schools in Colorado. And this was his last position was superintendent of schools there at the JCPS in Colorado, which was had about a um, student population of 87,000 students. Uh, he was also nominated by President Obama to the National Board of Education Science. So we're looking forward to having him on board. He has um, visited us a couple of times virtually, and I'm really looking forward to him starting in September. So every year, at the end of the year, for those of you who are new to gifted and talented education, there is a, a report that is due for districts, and this report is called the Summative Evaluation. And I look at this report along with my leadership in order to know how to serve our, our, um, our state better. And there's a lot of information that comes from this report, which helps us to do that. So let's look at some of this data, and I hope that this will help, uh, will, uh, help you think about some of the different things that we're facing in this really unusual pandemic. Uh, one of those being equity and also thinking about how we're going to serve students uh, during this unusual time in our nation's history. So the first thing we're going to look at is the number of gifted and talented GT coordinators um, in our in our uh, state from last year. And as you can see, we have a lot of new um, people, almost 50%. And so what does that say? Well, to me, that says that we're gonna need some training and some guidance, some small groups, maybe some mentors for all the new people that we have on board in our state. And then we also have, you know, several veteran people in our state, uh, those who have 21 to 26 years of experience. But then we also have a quarter of our, of our gifted coordinators who um, are still relatively new you know, six to 10 years. So that's some interesting information to look at as we move forward with training and with uh, opportunities for uh, staff in our state. 
here's a little bit more information about the people who are the coordinators in our state. And as you can see, um, many of our coordinators have gifted certification, but they also have superintendent and supervisor of instruction certification. So as I'm looking at this, to me, this says we, we have people who are wearing probably many different hats in our state. And so we need to support them as best we can with information about gifted education and best practices. Then we looked at how many students are provided with direct instructional services by the GT teachers in our, in our district. And as you can see, the average or the most, I guess, is 200 to 500 students. So that means that probably one to two teachers have a really large caseload. So I just wanna ask you to stop and pause for a minute and in the chat box, if you would, how can districts support GT teachers with such a large caseload? So I can't really see the chat box in the view that I'm in. So Tyler, if you see some responses come in about that. So the question is, how can districts support G teachers with such a large caseload? Lisa says gifted education PLCs and cohorts. That is a really good opportunity for, um, for us to talk with others is that those professional learning communities, which are usually a little bit smaller than a whole staff uh, faculty meeting. That's a good one. Sam suggested involving school level administrators in GT programming. That's very important for uh, administrators to understand the, the large caseload that uh, GT teachers carry. That's a good idea too. Lori suggested providing PD for gen ed teachers to help provide differentiation. That is a really good suggestion because, you know, it, it's like the African proverb that talks about that it takes, you know, a village to raise a child. And that's so true. In gifted education, we need everyone on board to help differentiate and offer services to students. And those are really good. Let's do a couple of more, Tyler. Rebecca suggested facilitating opportunities to qualify and hire more teachers who can teach gifted education. That's a really good, um, good idea too. We have, um, are always looking for, for new um, teachers who have gifted certification. It's one of those critical areas in our state and we do need more people and we need to encourage a diversified um, staff to apply for gifted certification. Very good. One more. Harmony said providing classroom teachers with resources to allow extension to help, not just and pull out. Yes, that's a really good idea too. And I know with all that is going on in our world with pandemic today, uh, with some a group I met with yesterday, uh, they were very concerned about not overwhelming the staff as we go back to school this year, but being a support, being there for them, having those resources, uh, being that support for them. And so those are all really good ideas. Thank you for putting your ideas in the chat. I really appreciate that. So next we're gonna look at just some student population information. So the summative evaluation is kind of a reflective self-report. And it, I hope that it helped for people to look at their data and to, to discuss that with the staff and also with their administrators so that it helps to inform them about uh, decisions moving forward for, the, for this school year. So let's look at some of that data. So we're gonna uh, take a poll here in just a minute. Uh, which ethnicity group do you think has the least number of GT students? Is it African-American or black? Hispanic or two or more races. So in our GT programs, which ethnicity group do you think is least represented? So, oh, people are submitting their answers. Tyler, do I need to submit an answer in order to see the poll? 
No, they are coming in and I will share the results in just a minute. Awesome. Technology is so great because it allows us to uh, interact with each other and to share ideas. I'm like Dr. Julia. I have really learned a lot about technology as well. So which ethnicity group do you think has the least number of GT students? And the responses were mostly Hispanic, 46% with African-American and black coming in at 39% and two or more races coming in at 14%. So let's look and see what our data from last year told us. So according to uh, our data, African-Americans are least represented in our gifted programs at 39.1% and then with Hispanic a population coming in at 27.6%, and then with two or more races coming in closely after that at 21.3%. So I hope that this kind of helps you look at our GT program and that this will, we can have some more conversations about this as we move forward, about how we can have more equity in our program. That's what we're gonna talk about here in the next several minutes. So here is a, another poll. What GT subgroup has the greatest identification disproportionality? So is it free and reduced, free and reduced lunch, students with disabilities, or English learners? This was another question that was asked in the summit evaluation where people looked at their data. So which do you think it is? Free and reduced lunch, students with disabilities, or English learners in our state? And so what people were doing is they were looking at their total population of those groups and then looking at their GT groups and looking at the discrepancy between those two groups as they looked at their data. All right, and so most people put students with disabilities, 61%. So let's look and see what our data showed us from last year. Last year, our data showed us that you were correct, students with disabilities at 47.7%. So that's 50%. All right, let's go ahead and look at some, at some other information that the summative evaluation helps people look at their program. All right, so I wanna look a, a little bit about uh, talking about local norms and about special considerations. So our gifted regulation states that special considerations, and it, which are exceptions to the gifted criteria, and local norms or national norms can be used to identify and select students. Local norms can be used at the district, school, or subgroup level. Special considerations and local norms ensure the district is using a process to ensure equitable access to the gifted program for all students. And here are some resources that provide information on these two topics. And so on our GT resources page, there is a guidance document about special considerations, how to use that, and also one on local norms. Also, we partnered with several people with a Javits grant for, for four years. And there are many great resources that came out of this project. And so if you'll go and, to this link here, or just type in WKU Javits, it'll bring you to all these different resources. And there is a resource there which is a brochure that's called Using Local Norms, a Strategy to Reduce Excellence Gaps. So both of these are really good resources if you want to know more about how to use local norms and special considerations. Okay, let's look a little bit at our GT categories. So we're talking about in our state, I know we, we had invited or there were some national, international people who were gonna come to our um, gifted update today. In, in our state, we are one of the few states that has five categories. Not only do we have general intellectual ability, we also have uh, creativity, leadership, and the visual and performing arts, as well as the specific aptitude areas. So let's just take a, a, a brief look at what our information from our data shows us about these different categories in our state. 
So again, just a quick poll, just to kind of keep you engaged here so that it's not all about me. What do you think is the state's average with our primary talent poll? poll? So as you answer that question, I'll just talk a little bit about primary talent pool. So in our state, uh, primary talent pool is kindergarten through third grade. And these are students who are informally selected uh, to help engage them at an early age. And our district talks about that we should try to have a quartile of those students. And so what this means is with those five different areas that I just talked about that you usually have students in grades kindergarten through fifth grade at your school who are maybe, you know, you got 5% you know, from your visual and performing arts, 5% leadership, 5% uh, creativity, 5%, you know, maybe from uh, a specific area like math or language arts or science or social studies, and then 5% from general intellectual ability. That's what we're hoping when we're talking about that 25% that of your students. Not that you're looking at that stay nine of 75% and that you're selecting students, you know, at the top 25% of, of your school as you're looking at different diagnostic assessments. Now you're trying to make a, a wide net, you're casting a wide net in order to have a, a base from which to formally identify in grades four through 12. So, um, Thank you, Tyler, for sharing the results of that. So most of you put that you thought that that, that we were in the 11 to 20% range. Let's see if you were correct. So you were, you were correct. We are somewhere between 11 and 20%, 11 and 20 cent percent. So we're almost there, but as you can see, We've got some people who were in the 21 to 25 percent range, and that's really good. So it's really important that we continue to work on our primary talent pool and to engage those students at an early age so we don't um, lose them before they get to grades K through four. Okay, so we have a report in our state. Um, and it used to be called the Opportunity Access Report. It's now called the QA Gifted and Talented Report that gives us information that we can use to make, you know, some decisions about our gifted program. And so uh, in reviewing this report, as you look at this information, which state assessed area has the smallest number of students? So we have, as you look at that, it's social studies for our state. It's 72%. And then coming in next is science at 24%. So that's a, you know, a lot of students that probably are going unidentified in those two areas. And I guess for me that the question is, well, why, why is that, that number so large? Why is that number so large? And I looked at some of the, the responses that people gave as they were making plans and looking at their data. And many of them had several different things to say. But before I say anything about what I learned, in the chat box, if you would, let's see if I can move this forward. In the chat box, you know, type a response to this question. So besides increasing funds to the GT program, what could be done to assist districts with identifying students in science and social studies? So if you would, just take a few minutes and think about that. If we want to increase our identification in these two important programs, science and social studies, and we know that the gifted regulation says that we, that we must, that we must identify in these areas, what could be done to assist districts with this besides Leslie, just increasing funds? Leslie suggested alternate testing after the formal test administered in fourth grade. Alter testing. Could you read that just one more time, Tyler? Alternate testing after the formal test administered in fourth grade. So I think Leslie is meaning to continue to test, not just at that one time. Right, right. We should not be a one and done system. We should be um, 
uh, a state that's continually looking for gifted and talented students. And so you can do that for many different ways as you look, look at uh, other, other, other ways to identify students, uh, you know, as you're collecting that information and then you have those, um, those norm reference assessments that are given too. That's a good one, yes. What else, Tyler? Anything Someone else? recommended universal tests for both subjects without K prep to use as a screener. It's hard to find students who qualify to test. It is. It is. It is. And we have in our state moved to criterion reference test. Uh, back with uh, SB1, um, we are no longer allowed to give normal reference test any longer. We, so we've had to move to criterion reference test. And so the state will no longer be able to offer normal reference test. And so it's going to be upon the, the shoulders of the districts to purchase those tests. And so perhaps, you know, if you're in a district that is in a neighboring district, maybe you can pool your resources um, to, to purchase some assessments. And if you're looking for some assessments, there's the GT coordinator sample handbook that's also posted on the GT resources website that'll give you some suggestions about, um, you know, norm reference assessments that you can use in order to help you uh, look for these students that would be identified in these areas. One more, Tyler, if there are any more. Dana suggested educating teachers on what those gifted kids look like if they don't have assessments available to use as criteria. Right, so you can be looking for those other evidences until you have a normal reference assessment. Um, so that's a good suggestion as well. Uh, you do have to have that, that ninth day nine component unless you are using um, uh, special considerations and special considerations would be those students who maybe have a disability of some kind uh, or a disadvantage either economically or culturally or you have those underachieving students where there's a discrepancy in what they are doing as compared to what they could do. So those are really good suggestions. All right. Well, thank you for Patrick, thinking about that. Yes. There were several other suggestions in the chat. We will follow okay. those and make sure that you see those as well later. Okay, all right, sounds good. Um, Tyler, what is my, my time? Do I need to finish up here in another couple of minutes or I can't remember what my time was. I see Julia saying that you're good with time for now. Okay, all right, thank you. So let's move forward then and talk a little bit about professional development then. So this was the question that was on the summit evaluation and it talks about, you know, are you offering professional development, not to your G, not just to your GT teachers, but to all the faculty, all the staff who work with gifted students. And as you can see, a large majority of our districts are offering professional development. And I would, I would um, encourage you, especially as we we're talking about equity uh, today, and I feel like that's going to be a focus for our, for our state in the coming years, that we also uh, talk to our staff about special considerations, how that's used, why it's used, what to look for with our students, uh, to be looking at our data for our disproportionalities, to also think about the social emotional needs of our gifted children. That is going to be so important this year um, as we have students who are missing, missing their, their friends at school, missing that contact with their teacher, um, just very important for us to talk about the social emotional needs of our gifted children and also to talk about local norms. Uh, those norms where you're still looking at the 96 percentile, but the cut score may be different. All right. So all districts receive a state grant um, to expend on their GT program and their students. And so 75% of those funds have to be used to hire a GT certified person who's going to provide direct instructional services. However, many districts, as you can see, allocate other funds because it's just a grant. It's not meant to be, be the end all be all, although I know in this uh, current economic uh, time, Sometimes that's, that's all they have to expend on the GT program, unfortunately. But as you can see, we've got 62% who spend somewhere between zero to, to you know, to $50,000, 
maybe I should say one to $50,000 on their gifted program, which is awesome. Um, then we have 20% who are f spending, you know, 51 to $100,000 in addition to what they receive for the state grant. And I just want to remind you guys that the, we have about six, about approximately $6.2 million that comes from the General Assembly. Uh, we're not underneath special education funds. We're not a part of IDEA in our state. Uh, we're a separate program in our state. And so we don't receive those federal dollars. All of our dollars are state funded dollars. And that's where the money comes, comes from. And as you know, we're under a kind of an economic crisis in our state. And so we, we, it's really imperative that we think of other things and other ways to serve our students besides just thinking about funding, although funding is important. But I just wanted you to understand where those dollars come from in our state. All right, let's take just a few minutes and look at this new QA gifted and talented report. So this has replaced the GT detail report in Infinite Campus and the opportunity access report. And there's a lot of good data to review. And um, so I'd like for us to look at this state report. This is a report that, that districts uh, need to have access, access, I can't talk today, access to. And uh, if you need to know where that is, um, you know, please email me if you're not sure. You do have to have permissions to see this report. And so this is something that you would get from your cases contact or your district te technology administrator. So let's just take a few minutes and look at this report. It's a three page report. And so in the first report that we're looking at here, uh, this is some information from the 1920-20 school year, and it gives you a lot of good information. And what we're looking at here is our state information. This is information from our state. And as you can see last year, it looks like we had about 94,572 students who were selected or identified for the gifted program. And that's quite a lot when you think about it. Um, when you look at that to the total, we had about 684,000 students in our state. And then it breaks it down by gender, also uh, subgroups of race and ethnicity, and then also by um, other accountable groups such as free and reduced price meals, students with disabilities, and English learners. So I've just kind of given you a little screenshot of what that report looks like on the first page there. And as we're looking at our ethnicity there, uh, we see that we have about 6.7% of African American students who are represented in our gifted program across the state as compared to 10.6% of the total uh, population of students. So in our state, there's about 10% African American students and we in our state have selected about 6%. Now, kind of as a rule of thumb by some of the experts in gifted education, you should have about 80% of your student ethnic population identified for gifted services. So as we're looking at that 10% that number, we want to multiply that times 0.8 or about 80%. And so we really should be back in, or, in order to be more proportional around, you know, 8% rather than 6%. Um, then as you look at, you know, the other ones, so say we look at Hispanic, you know, we're at about 4.35%. And as a state, though, we're at 7.5%. So you can, as you can see, if you were to do the math there, uh, you know, we should be, you know, closer probably to about, you know, um, uh, about five, five and a half percent, closer to 6% than at 4%. So this isn't to say that it's all about the numbers. I'm not trying to do that at all or say that at all. But I do want us to be thinking about equity and looking at our policies and processes for how we identify students and, um, and helping you to also, you know, look and process your data as you think about looking at your data for the coming school year. All right, let's look at page two. So page two of this report even breaks it down even more. And this gives you by the gifted category counts. And as you look over at the far right hand uh, side, you'll see that out of that 95,000 or so students, 26,000 of those students are primary talent pool. And in the future, I'd, I would like for us to 
even parse out this information even more because it kind of makes it look like we have more uh, identified students than we really do in a way. Because uh, we know, as I said before, primary talent pool is not formally selected. Uh, it's, it's a part of our gifted program, but it's, it's a different part of our program. And so, as you can see, you know, um, that may kind of make it look like we have more than we really do. And then as you look at those numbers as well, as we look at our African American students, as we talk about et ethnicity, uh, about 5,000 of those students of the 95,000 are African American or black. But from those uh, 5,000, we have about 2,000 that are in primary talent pool which really means we only have that 3,000 that we're formally identifying. So that's kind of interesting to think about. And then you can do the same for the other ethnicity groups. Uh, for our Hispanic students, uh, we have about 3,600 that were, have been selected or identified. And of those Hispanic students, about 1,200 are, are primary talent pool. So that's kind of interesting to look at. Uh, as we look at our um, information by other sub subgroups, uh, 35,000 of the 95,000 come from um, free and reduced lunch. And out of that 35,000, 11,000 are PTP. So it's just kind of interesting to kind of look at your information and, and to think about um, your equity and your proportionality. Let's look at the last page. The last page breaks, breaks down this information by grade, by grade level, which is kind of interesting to look at. And so as you can see, we have, um, you know, lots of different students in primary talent pool in kindergarten and first grade and second grade and third grade. And when you look at those numbers, you could maybe make some inferences from those numbers, kind of interesting. And also at the, at the other information there. But I won't, I don't want to, um, you know, pause too long on that because um, I don't want to use up all my time there. Uh, Tyler, I saw that there were some things that maybe popped up in the chat box. Uh, is there anything that, that you, that we need to talk about or share or people had questions about? I think they were asking for links for different things and I've shared that in there. I okay. don't have any questions you need to address right now though. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. All right, um, so let's talk about services. We've talked about identification. We know that services is really important too. Uh, what services do you think that stakeholders found most beneficial? So was it pull out, enrichment, differentiation, dual credit, mentoring, or special schools and classrooms? And so um, as part of the program evaluation, districts have to survey their, their stakeholders for their attitudes about their program. And so what do you think most of them said about services that were most beneficial? I wonder if it'll be the, the one that you thought it was. Was it pull out? Was it enrichment? Was it differentiation? Was it dual credit? Was it mentoring? Was it special schools? And of course, these are just some of the services that are offered, but these were some of the top ones that I, I pulled out from the data. All right, and so most people thought that it was pull out, and then second was enrichment, and then third was differentiation. Well, so let's look at what the data tells us. What do stakeholders think? All right, so in reviewing the responses, Enrichment opportunities were the, were the um, service that most stakeholders thought were, were the most, um, most important or most beneficial. And then close behind that was like you said, pull out services and then differentiation and then um, dual credit. So I don't know if you thought that that was pretty interesting, but I found that very interesting those enrichment opportunities for students are very important to stakeholders. Okay, 
So uh, this, this, this past year when we started, or this beginning of this, this year when I came on back in August of 1st, uh, there's only one of me at the state. And so I asked my leadership, could I have a, a group of people that I could also uh, share ideas with, get input with? And I told them that there were many GT cadres that met across the state, and I felt like that if I could meet with this, these leaders from across the state, it would help us to, to um, share ideas about hot topics, to, um, to get some input on guidance that would come out from the department and, and be a sounding board for me as well as for them so that we ensure that the, the message across the state stays the same. So um, I wanted to share some of these, uh, these people with you so that if you are, are looking for uh, some support, especially if you're a new person, as I said before, we have about 50% new people, a big turnover in our state with our GT coordinators. If you're looking for a, a, a group to hook up with, here are the people to reach out to. And I'll be sending this um, PowerPoint to, to Tyler and to Lynette and to Dr. Roberts so that they can share this with you. And um, so in the central region, we have Leanne Pickerel. Leanne Pickerel is a GT coordinator and dean of students there in Paris Independent. In Fayette County, uh, there's Julie Gann. Julie Gann is the GT coordinator there for Fayette County. And she also works in conjunction there with the central uh, Kentucky area. In Jefferson County, we've got Jessica Thompson. And I meant to also put Stacy Edelman. Jessica is new. Uh, there at JCPS, but you can reach out to her if you've got questions or need support there in JCPS. In our northern area, we have an NCAGE group there, and Shannon Gupser is the facilitator for that group. They are a really great group of people and very supportive of each other. Uh, in the northeastern part of our state, or the um, KEDC region, is Jenny Jenkins. She lives in Rowan County. You know, you know, uh, the Ohio, ugh, I can't talk again, Ohio Valley Education Center area, Janet Frazier. And our southeastern district is Jean Lee from Harlan County. Our southwestern region is Jennifer Sheffield. Jennifer uh, works as the GT coordinator there in all things GT, along with some other people uh, in Simpson County. Then in the Lake Cumberland region, we also have um, a cadre, Beth Patrick. And then also in the Western Kentucky region is Toddy Adams. And Toddy is in, uh, I don't have her email correct there. Toddy, I'm going to, have to fix that. She is in Marshall County. So I apologize for that. Toddy, I will fix that before I send that out. So these are some good groups to hook up with. And um, if you ever have any questions or whatever, uh, we are meeting once a month in order to make sure that we are staying on the same page as an as a educational uh, program in our state. So please reach out to these, these people if you ever have questions or need them to bring things to our table for, for us to discuss once a month. Um, next, I just want to talk about some guidance that I hope will be coming out soon. It's called uh, Frequently Asked Questions uh, for the Gifted and Talented Program during uh, COVID-19. Um, as I said, we, we came together um, as a group for the first time back in August, the GT Leader Cadre, and I asked them to reach out to their regional uh, district people and to bring questions that were really, uh, or concerns that they had. And as we looked at these concerns, they seemed to come into this, these three main topics. And these three main topics were assessment and screening, services, and accountability and participation. So along with them, I've been working on some guidance that, I, like I said, uh, I hope that will I can pass along to you very soon. And let me just see if I can change screens here and show you what that guidance looks like. I don't know if you can still see that or not. Tyler, can you still see my second screen there? We can see the Word document now. Okay, awesome. So this is what the frequently asked questions will look at. And so some of the questions had already been answered in guidance or by the time I got around to uh, giving this to my leadership to approve, there were some new guidance that came out. And so I just want you to see that uh, the first five questions there uh, are answered in existing guidance, like how do we uh, serve visual and performing arts students safely? Uh, 
testing materials. How do we do that safely? How do we pull students out? Um, sanitizing materials, uh, participating in gifted services. All of these are answered in uh, guidance that's already out by the State Department. And let me see if I can just show you some of this. Um, so this is our main landing page here is the KDE landing page. And then when you click on KDE's uh, COVID-19 page, it'll take you to some reopening guidance as well. And then I put links into the guidance document. Here is the one for exceptional learners and preschool students. And this answers many questions that have come up about services and testing materials, those types of things. Um, and here's the section on gifted and talented students. And it talks about providing social distancing and about staff, contact tracing, those types of things. Here's the, the flagship document that talks a lot about the expectations. I'm sure that your school is, is, has gone over with you about safety practices for school. There's another document about participation, how to go about doing participation defining participation, uh, ways that schools will be able to take participation. Um, this last one it, that came out just a couple of weeks ago that has to do with uh, students, work, welcoming students for orientation and targeted services, uh, mentions gifted and talented students and has some good information about uh, screening uh, and assessing students, how to go about doing that, uh, what the guidance is about, how to go about doing that, and then I've also tried to answer just a few more questions about that. Not a very long document. Uh, the next part has to do with assessment and screening. And I, this is a question that's come up quite a bit uh, over the past month is about how do I, if I'm doing remote instruction or uh, you know, a hybrid type of situation, how do we go about assessing and screening students? And so we've tried to give some guidance there about you know, how to do that that you may not have the resources to do an online screening. And if you don't, uh, then can you go ahead and do that? Well, yes, of course, that would be a district decision about how you do that. And then some things to be thinking about is that you could go ahead and be collecting other evidence until you're able to um, you know, assess students formally if you need to, but do be collecting other other evidence. You know, don't don't be waiting, especially for your primary talent pool students. They don't have to be formally assessed. You know, be reaching out to your your um, staff as they get to know their their students, and be asking them about you know who are those high potential students in those five areas that we talked about earlier. Not just your your cognitive areas, but your visual and performing arts uh, areas, which of course are also cognitive as well. But I hope you understand what I'm trying to say there. Um, there's a there were questions about, you know, can you use online uh, platforms for testing? And yes, you can. And I've tried to uh, give you some things to think about as you do online testing that, of course, you know, that validity factor needs to be a valid test. Uh, there needs to be somebody who's proctoring that test. Think about equity making sure that if you're screening students that everybody gets screened at some point, you know, if you're going to schedule students to come in and make appointments and you're doing screening, you need to make sure that everybody gets screened, whatever, um, you know, grade level you've decided to do or grade levels, that kind of thing. Um, don't feel like you have to use a, um, when you screen that you have to use, you know, an assessment of some kind. It can be some other method uh, of, of screening, although I know a lot of people do use an assessment. Um, just be thinking about different ways. Maybe you could screen this year rather than using assessment, maybe. Um, communication is so important, you know, that parents and, and your staff understand what you're trying to do and uh, what the purpose is and why validity is port important. And then also confidentiality of those assessments or those, uh, those screening processes and those responses that you get back. That's really important to, to be, to, uh, to keep all that in private with student information. And then there was a few questions about services. Service is a big, a big area. You know, how am I going to provide services for students in this remote environment? And uh, again, this is a district decision. People are going to have to be thinking, you know, outside the box about how they're going to do that and how they're going to collaborate with the general education teacher. And people are all learning different, different ways about uh, how to, uh, you know, the ins and outs of how technology works and doesn't work and, and the, um, those types of things. 
and then uh, questions about gifted service plans, how will virtual learning students have their needs met through their gifted service, uh, service plan. People are like, well, do well, I have to change my gifted student service plan? Uh, do I mark everything? It's just important to know that these are district decisions. I've tried to give some guidance here. Uh, just remember that, um, you know, according to the regulation for each area students are identified in, there must be, you know, two services for each student and that, you know, depending on the district's resources, you know, be thinking about, you know, those services that could be offered um, in both situations. I don't think you want to mark everything there, but if you've got any specific questions about that, feel free to email me about that. Um, how do staff communicate that gifted services are not extra work? Uh, this is something that's come out, come up before we had COVID-19, but I think is, has really begun to be a, you know, a question during this time. I've tried to give an answer about that. There is a KSBA policy uh, that comes from Chapter 8, Policy 132, that states that, um, you know, students in the GT program don't have to make up uh, missing classwork. Um, She's going back <laughs> um, while providing services to the district program. And of course, this would have to be a policy that's that's adopted uh, by your board, but something to think about. And also important, as we said before, to talk about with those professional learning communities and other opportunities you have to talk about with your staff. And then uh, a big topic of discussion has been visual and performing arts uh, services for our students. And so, you know, when we don't have necessarily maybe those people in our district because they've been assigned to other work during this pandemic, uh, you know, what, what other kind of things can we think about? And we do have a group from our advisory council who's going to be working on, on offering some, uh, some resource um, suggestions for that too. But some just general things to think about would be, you know, consortiums, independent study, seminars, uh, mentoring, and of course, distance learning, maybe with, uh, you know, um, another person, another specialist in that area, maybe at the university level or someone in your district, that kind of thing. So just wanted to kind of share that with you. Um, Tyler, did we have any uh, questions or concerns or? Kathy, there was a question about when this document would be ready for sending out to people. Right, I'm hoping next week that my, uh, my leadership will have had a chance to, to approve it. Um, it's, uh, it has to go up through several different layers in, in my office. So it's at the very final layer and I'm hoping that it will be released next week. Um, if anybody would like to have a copy of this as a draft, I'd be glad to send it to you as a, a draft and an email. So just uh, reach out to me about that. And just remember that it might change. It may not be the same as what I'm showing you here today. This is just a draft. And I did want you to, to know that we are listening to you and that we are very concerned about any issues uh, that you have with your program. Are there any any other concerns other or anything like that? But I think that you'll need to look at them afterwards. So I'll email those to you. Okay, sounds good. Let me see if I can get back to sharing my my PowerPoint here, trying to figure out how to do that. And I'm just about finished. I hope I'm not taking up somebody else's time. I'm trying to move this out of the way so that I can. All right. So we're back to my PowerPoint, I hope. Do you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, awesome. All right, so we've looked at the frequently asked questions document. Uh, again, here are some uh, links to the, the guidance documents that I talked about earlier, and I'll send a copy of this PowerPoint to, to a CAGE so that they can post it. Uh, we also have, um, are privileged to have a state advisory council in our, in, our dis, in our state, and we have several members and we meet quarterly to talk about issues, about services for students, and uh, we're an advisory council to the to the department um, and to the Board of Education. Here are our members and as you can see we have lots of different represent, representation from across the state. Uh, Dr. Roberts is our chairperson for our uh, advisory council and then we also have other representation 
And if you also have things that you would like for them to bring to the advisory council meeting, our next meeting will be in November. So you can also reach out to, to these people here um, if you have anything that you would like for them to bring to the advisory council. Or you can reach out to me because I sit on the advisory council as well. Um, as, as part of the support this year, uh, during the new gifted and talented training that I offered two weeks ago, I asked if there was any, any interest in a, a gifted and talented coordinator and new GT teacher cadre. And there seemed to be quite a bit of interest in that. And I also, I also asked if there was anybody who was interested in being a mentor to these people who might have an interest in having a mentor. And so if you're still interested in that, um, the, the video and PowerPoint from that training is on the GT Resources webpage. And if you would, um, Tyler, put that form, there's a form that he's going to put in the chat box and you can click on that form and go, if you're a, you know, a new person somewhere, you know, just starting this year or three years, that's what the focus is for this group. And, um, I'll be able to see that on the form and I'm going to try to start those uh, meetings next month and then also be looking for reaching out to people across the state to to mentor anyone who says that they're interested in having some support them this year with ideas and just someone to listen to that's so important to have people listen to you and to give feedback. Well, this is my, my last slide here. This is my contact information. Uh, thank you so much for listening to me. I hope that I've given you some information to think about today, uh, some resources that can help support you in your school year. Please feel free to reach out to me either through telephone or through email if you ever have any questions. I promise to get back to you. Sometimes it may take me 24 hours, but I promise I'll get back to you and answer you just as soon as, as I can. I just want you to know I appreciate all of you. Are you the ones who are touching students and parents and teachers' lives this year? And I, I hope and pray uh, that you have a safe, safe and uh, blessed school year. So thank you for this opportunity, opportunity to, to talk with you today.